Hello, my merry band of O-Satters, one and all, and welcome to this, the 85th episode of the Sockmetician podcast. My name is Nathan Taylor, otherwise known as Sockmetician, and I'm recording this from my home in North London. Hello, everybody. It's been a while. I'm very aware that my podcast episodes have been a little bit erratic and sporadic over the, the last uh, however long, um, but this one is very, very special. This uh, shows you a little bit of this just now and intrepid and uh, long time watchers of this podcast will be very familiar with that shawl. We're very familiar with it because uh, I started this very podcast enterprise however many years ago with an episode called Genesis. It was Genesis because it was the genesis of my podcast episode. It was also Genesis named after one of my shawls. 11 years later or whenever it is nine years later since I, I can't remember how long ago it is that I knitted it I'm finally ready to release the pattern so this episode is Genesis 2 and I'm really really excited about that but before we get on to that the stuff that you've been really waiting for that is there um, before that uh, I should do a little catch up and um, pretend I know what I'm doing as a podcaster because it's been a little while uh, so this is number 85 and very quickly let me run through some fun facts about the number 85 I really <laughs> looking forward to this. 85 is the product of two prime numbers. Mm, 5 and 17. The product means you multiply the two together. So 17 multiplied by 5 is 85. It's obviously a natural number following 84 and preceding 86. You know that. Um, but anything that is the product of two primes also has the name of being semi-prime. So uh, let's say three is a prime number and seven is a prime number. So 21 is also, is, is semi-prime, see what I mean? Uh, five and 17 are the two primes that are the prime factors of uh, 85. It is specifically the 24th semi-prime. It, and is also the fourth in the sum of five multiplied by something else, which is prime. So you've got five multiplied by well, one is, we don't count one, do we? Five multiplied by two is prime. So 10 is a semi-prime of that form, five multiplied by something. Five multiplied by three is blah, blah, blah. And it's the uh, 24th, sorry, it's, I don't think, I, I don't think I've understood that bit. <laughs> oh yeah, so it's, uh, it, there's, what? So it's five multiplied by a prime number. So five multiplied by, Seven is 35, but we've got two, three, five, seven. That doesn't make any sense to me. If anybody does understand why that is true, the fact that it is uh, the fourth, so I, do you know, don't even bother. If, if, if you had, I'm not even trying to explain it because I don't understand it. If you know from the little I've said badly, what I was talking about, then please let me know. Otherwise, let's forget, forget that never happened. Forget that ever happened. Pretend it never happened. You see, listen, I'm not very well. <laughs> I've got a bit of a cold. I don't think it's COVID. Um, I've got a really sore throat. You can, might be able to sound a little bit croaky. I've got sort of a sniffy nose. My ears are itchy and I feel a little bit chesty. But um, I, other than that, I'm in really good spirits. I'm just not sure my brain is working particularly on all cylinders. So let's ignore that, shall we? Um, so it is also, now this is kind of fun, it is together with 86 and 87, it forms the second cluster of three consecutive semi-primes. So remember, a semi-prime is a, is, a, is, a, is a number who has, that has two prime factors, uh, and the, uh, <laughs> so it's the product of two primes, and uh, it is the, second cluster of semi of three consecutive semi primes which are in this case 85 86 and 87 um the first because i know you're begging for me to tell you is 33 34 and 35 i think you i will just have to take the word for wikipedia on that that 33 34 and 35 are all semi primes but that's the first existing cluster of three consecutive semi primes and 85 86 87 is the second cluster of three consecutive semi primes gotcha got me with me Got it. <laughs> um, it is with with a 
Okay, here's where, here's where we get a bit technical. With a prime aliquot sum of 23, it is in the short aliquot sequence 85, 23, 1, 0. Now, aliquot, stay with me. Um, an aliquot sum is, uh, so, so if it's an aliquot sum of a positive number. So 85 is a positive number is the sum of all proper divisors of that number. So the aliquot sum of 6 would be uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3. So the aliquot sum of 6 is also 6, which makes it a perfect number, but that's a completely different thing. Um, so the aliquot sum of uh, 7, because 7 is prime, would be only 1 and itself. So uh, am, I, am I getting this right? The aliquot so <laughs> I should, I should I should make sure I understand all of this a little bit better before I embark on telling you about it. I apologise for that. Hashtag sorry, not sorry. It's just a bit of a laugh, isn't it? Um, so the aliquot sum of positive integer n is the sum of all proper divisors of n, that is, all divisors of n other than n itself. So uh, the that's right. So the aliquot sum of 7 would be, sorry, the aliquot sequence, the aliquot sum of 7 is 1 because the only divisor, um, apart from itself, which we don't count. Therefore, the aliquot sequence of 7 would be 7, 1, and then 0, because 0 has no divisors other than its, because 1 has 0 divisors other than itself. Um, so in this case, the aliquot sum of 85 is 23, so that would include 1 and 5 and 17, Five and seven. Oh, yeah, I think that's right, isn't it? One and five is because they're, they're the two primes that it is. So one and five is six, and 17 is 23. Yeah, so the aliquot sum of 85 is 23. The aliquot sum of 23, because it's prime, is one, and the aliquot sum of one is zero, as we've already established. So the aliquot sequence of 85 is 85, 23, 1, 0. I imagine some aliquot sequences might loop and go on infinitely. That's only my guess. Uh, it is an octahedral number. 85 is an octahedral number. How cool is that? An octahedron, of course, is uh, a shape which looks like um, two four-sided pyramids um, stuck together, sort of with their bases. So you have a, a square-based pyramid where each side is a triangle coming to a point, and you have another one of those upside down stuck on the top. Can you picture what that means? So each side kind of looks like a diamond as you rotate it around its uh, equator. Um, and if you have little spheres that you put together, um, have you ever played with those little um, magnets, little balls, you can make little shapes out of them? So you can make octahedrons out of little spheres, and 85 is, is one of those in the sequence of octahedral numbers. It is also a centred triangular number. Now I'm going to give you, a, actually, do you know what? I'll go back to octahedral numbers and I'll show you what's on here. Can you see that, that shape there? That's the octahedron octahedron uh, and that is the, the shape it's making. That one is an octahedron octahedral number that has uh, six balls along each side. Is that right? Yeah, that's got six. Um, 85 as an octahedral number only has five uh, spheres along each of its vertices like that. Uh, and then the, uh, the centred triangular number is where you have like concentric layers of equilateral triangles. So the first one in the middle would be a dot in the middle, and then you'd have three dots around that, and then you'd have one, two, three, two, three, three six dots around that. So that essentially that sequence looks like this. One, and then that's the next one, that's the next one. Can you see each of the blue layers is uh, another triangle with one more dot each side. So each side on that one is only one, each side on that one is two, each side on that one is three, each side on that one is four. Um, I don't quite know how many you have to get up to to get to. One, four, 10, 19, 31, 46, 64, 85. So you've quite a few up that sequence before you get there. It's also a centered square number, which is a similar sort of progression like that. And 85 would be the 1, 1, 5, 13, 25, 41, 61, 85, that number. 
It is also a decagonal number or decagonal number, not sure how that's pronounced. Um, and I didn't explain, I didn't understand any of the explanation of that when I looked at it. So if anyone wants to look up decagonal or decagonal numbers, then feel free to fall down that rabbit hole. I don't go in there. Um, it's also a, uh, it's, this is quite fun. It's the smallest number that can be expressed as a sum of two squares with all squares greater than one in two ways. Now that's a lot to unpack there. So it's, it's a number, if you have a, a number that can be expressed as the sum of two squares, as in adding together two square numbers with all squares greater than one. And then if you can do it in two different ways, this is the smallest number that you can do that with. So it's the first in its own sequence. Um, so look at, the, look at the two ways. 85 is equal to nine squared plus two squared. Nine squared is of course 81, two squared is four. 81 and four added together, the sum of two square numbers is, uh, is 85. Great, that's one way of doing it. 85 also equals seven squared, 49, plus six squared, 36. So 49 and 36 also add up to 85. And that's the smallest number where you can have the sum of two squares in two different ways. I think that's pretty cool. Um, there's all sorts of other stuff. Go, go to the Wikipedia page of 85 and, and have a look at that. There we go, let's get rid of that. Yeah. Um, so what have I been doing since I last saw you? I've been incredibly busy, actually. I had, um, I've been busy recently. I had quite, uh, a, not a lazy summer, but I didn't have a great deal of work on and I was quite enjoying um, a little bit of an indolent life. I was doing lots of social things, which was all very nice, but I didn't have a great deal of work on. Summer months for me tend to be a little bit uh, erratic because a lot of the corporate work that I do um, kind of fizzles out because summer is the time for holidays if you're in the corporate world. Um, that is something that I just have to, I, I get used to and I try and sort of squirrel away and build up all, all the money I can over the, the, the winter months and into the spring so that I can give myself a bit of a break if I'm not doing anything more long running than that. Um, but I'm currently the, uh, as I was last year, I may have talked about it on a podcast, I can't remember how many times I've seen you since then, um, but I'm the box office manager for uh, the UK Jewish Film Festival in 2023. And uh, it's a, we've, we've got quite a large festival this year. We've got over 80 screenings in cinemas up and down the country, um, 40 of which are in London and more than 40 of which are outside London. Um, and it's really, it's a lot to do, there's a lot to do. So, I, so being the box office manager, I have to set up all of the, uh, the screenings on our ticketing system. Um, I have to often build the seating plans for different venues. We're doing lots and lots of different venues that we've never done before. So I need to make sure I, <laughs> you have to be really, really accurate when you're building a seating plan. There can be no room for error. There is no room for vagary in tickets. You have to be very, very specific about everything because if you sell a seat that doesn't exist, someone's going to be very unhappy when they arrive and say, but I've got a ticket for H4. And they say, mm, H doesn't start until uh, number five. You go, uh, uh, that would be my fault. I also have to liaise with all of the, the venues and make sure that we've got all the right things going on. And they've got all the information that they need. And then I have to deal with our sponsors and our guest tickets because we have, as a festival, we have gala evenings um, where we have lots of um, special guests coming. Sometimes that may be filmmakers or performers in the films. Maybe it's people who are friends of uh, the charity that I, run, I work for, which is UK Jewish Film. And uh, that's a lot. And I've got to pull reports and do all that. So setting it up, big deal. When we go on sale, phew, I can kind of relax a little bit until the festival itself, which is uh, next month in the middle of November. And uh, it, just, it just doesn't really let up. Uh, however, I'm not going to be able to uh, be present for the full festival period because partway through, I'm going to be going to uh, I've just realised as I'm talking about this, I don't think I'm allowed to say it on social media. I'm going to do pantomime again. Um, I can't say where just yet. So uh, forgive me about that. I've just realised that in the contract I've only just signed, there was something about a social media embargo until they make the announcements. Uh, and so there was me about to go, oh, I'm going to blur. 
and I might have caught like got myself into a bit of trouble but I caught it I am doing pantomime I can say that um this year I'm not playing the baddie as I normally do uh, it's going to be a very very different experience for me playing a sort of more comedic character than bad uh, I've actually got two roles to play in the same show um I don't know how it'll be uh, it'll be a, a really different experience for me I'm used to sort of really working an audience to get them booing and jeering and hissing and screaming at me as much as possible. Um, and I really, really enjoy doing that. So I will slightly miss that this year, but I think I'm going to look forward to and enjoy doing something completely different and maybe a bit out of my comfort zone. And as a performer, it's always really healthy, I think, to be pushed out of your comfort zone. As a human being, it's healthy to be pushed out of your comfort zone. I always say this in my knitting classes back when I was doing a bit more uh, teaching that your comfort zone is not your friend it's actually your prison and it, uh, it only serves to hold you back and, and stops you from growing whereas if you can welcome more things into your comfort zone your comfort zone gets bigger and you can have more freedom uh, it's, those are those are things I really really stand by so that's basically what I've been doing in terms of my own knit um, I don't know where to start really uh, I haven't you might be able to see in the corner here a rather large pile of knitted stuff I don't really want to talk about that just yet um, I can say what it is but not in much detail I'm, I'm, I've designed a, a sort of a mathematical blanket um, and using a specific so it's not it's not mitered squares for example uh, it's uh, it's a shape that tessellates in a, in a different kind of way and it's really really kind of fun it's really lots of fun to knit it's just that because it's a blanket it's gonna be huge I desperately wanted something that's really massive probably sort of double bedspread size um, the individual sections don't want to be huge so therefore you have to knit a lot of them um, and I need 90 of these sections which are all that big um, <laughs> I promise I will talk about this in the future, of course I will, um, but I don't want to share too much about it. As you can see, millions of ends, that is the, the um, what I hadn't quite worked out is, is uh, there's a lots of ends because each shape is made up of lots of uh, miniature shapes that become this shape. It's very nerdy, very geeky, but it has been taking up all of my knitting time. As you can see, I'm using uh, the colours of the Sobertition edition, my own yarn range. So if anybody hasn't yet got their... Uh, their hands on some of my lovely yarn which is merino alpaca and possum spun in New Zealand and it's worsted spun for us it's gorgeous stuff um, then I would highly recommend heading over to sockmasiblings.com and purchasing your yarn now the reason I say that is because my sister and I we are the sock siblings as I'm sure many of you know we're probably not going to continue selling it forever um, we've we've done what we wanted to with it we, we you know we set up the little business together we've had a lot of fun doing it um, we don't have the time to really make a, a viable go out of this business um, so we'll probably we might not do any more ordering we might just sort of let the stock we've got go down so it it may mean that reserves of this become a little bit more exclusive and a bit more limited so uh, if you do want some of the sock magician edition yarn and why wouldn't you it's lovely stuff head over there now and get it while you can excuse me i'm feeling i've got a real post nasal drip going on it's a bit gross so that's been my my knitting essentially i've been doing a little bit of sort of experimenty figure outy stuff um uh what did i do a nice I've got a little swatch down here somewhere something i was fiddling around with recently oh it's underneath my light. Hold on a sec. There you go. So, oof, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I found I can't remember where. I, look, I've trolling, trolling through, trolling through, not trolling through. I don't do that. Um, <laughs> plenty of other people that do the trolling out there. I do the trolling through uh, YouTube, and was I just came across this really interesting stitch, um, which was uh, only knitted flat. And I thought that would be kind of fun knitted in the round and took a little bit of, you know, I had to play with it a little bit to, to work it out. But it, it's a really interesting um, 
I don't know what, I don't even know if it has a name, but the, the texture of it looks like this. Can you see these little diagonals? Um, it's not very stretchy, it's quite dense as a fabric, um, but it rolls around like that. And you, it, it's worked in two passes. Um, so this is, this is the second pass I'm on now, if I can even remember. Um, and so it, basically in the first pass, you, uh, you double up the number of stitches on your needle. Can you see they're all in pairs? You see I've got uh, two there, there are two strands there. Can you see that at all? Uh, that is two strands, that's two strands. So you do that by, I'm just trying to, <laughs> can't really remember. Um, probably should have thought about this before coming to talk to you. Um, no, that's not right. So essentially, you. Um, I'm going to try and figure this out for you, so that I can. You know, I might not be able to do this, um, but now I've spoken about it, I feel I really, really should have a go. Um, is that right? I think so. I think I've already. I think I've already done some work on these. The stitches in this round and what I've been playing with as well is a few decreases so what that has meant is that I have absolutely no wiggle room on the needle oh here we go I only needed to do half of it so here I don't know, I don't know what I've done this is my problem I sit down I fiddle around with things and then I don't actually do anything with it so how did I do this so you have to Oh, I know what it is. So rather than knitting into the stitch that's on the needle, you actually, you, you knit between the two stitches. Can you see my needle has gone between stitch one and two? And then you pull that through there and then you put that stitch, uh, sorry, and then you slip the next stitch like that. So I've now got two stitches where there was one. So I, sl I knit between the two stitches and then slip that stitch. And again, that gives me two loops. Knit between and slip, knit between and slip, knit between and slip. And then at the end, there's nothing to knit between except you are going between the next one. So what I do is I slip that there, I pick up a little strand there and I knit oh, I haven't I haven't done that right <laughs> I know what I've done wrong right let me uh, let me put this back correctly uh, hang on you come here for the good stuff don't you well sorry about that <laughs> I know what I know exactly what I've done wrong, so uh, forgive me while I just get this back to how it should be. Instead of knitting between, I'm such an idiot. Instead of knitting between, what you do is you knit underneath the running yarn that goes from one stitch to the other. That's what you do. Uh, and I'm ready to go. Here we go. So rather than just knit between them, I don't know what I was thinking there, I actually go under there. Is that is that even showing on the screen? So there's the running yarn there between this stitch and this stitch and I knit in there. That's what you do. And then you slip the top stitch. So you go in between the two stitches and under the running yarn, which is quite simple to do once you know what your what gap you're sort of aiming for. You go in there and then knit there, in there and knit there. So that's that's what I wasn't doing before. I was going I was just going underneath the needle, but you have to go down one further row than that. And what it's doing every time and you see, so actually on this one, I have to slip this one to get it out of the way just for now, pick up the running yarn, 
because it goes around the corner and then I can knit oh sorry and then then I have to slip that back and then I can knit underneath that running yarn again and slip it across like that what that does is it doubles up the number of the stitches and it's sort of pulling it's almost like a dip stitch it's pulling one stitch a new stitch around to the other side of the stitch which you then slip each time and then on the on the next pass uh, you have those those each one is in a pair and what you need to do with each of those is you work an SSK into them to align them up properly anyway that, that was the long-winded way of saying what I do what it gives you is this wonderful sort of diagonal stitch I've done all sorts of shenanigans by trying to figure out nice uh, you can see there's two columns there going into one trying to work out if I could um, play with some decreases and stuff. I'm not quite finished with that yet. I think it's really fun. It becomes incredibly dense. So I'm working this on, I think these are 5.5 millimeter needles and with some chunky yarn, I probably need to go up a needle size. And on the inside, it just looks like a, a sort of a, almost like a woven, a very dense uh, reverse stocking stitch. It's not it's quite attractive. Um, but I don't know why you'd go to all that trouble to get this on the outside <laughs> and leave all the fun stuff there. Um, but I quite like it. It's fun. Uh, this, these are the things I really enjoy doing. Every now and then, I don't really have the time to do much of this anymore. But I love just sitting down and, and sort of mucking around with stuff. That's basically how the idea of Double Knitted Brioche came about. Um, and a lot of the things that I've done with double knitting as well have just, been, just come from like figuring stuff out and putting it on the needles and playing with it. I really, really enjoy doing that kind of stuff. I wish I had more time. Um, if I had limitless amounts of money and didn't need to actually work for a living, I could spend all my time just sort of fiddling around with stuff. It's great fun. Um, so that's, that's essentially what I've been up to knitting wise. That and a little bit of play. So I guess you are hoping therefore that uh, I'm now going to talk about Genesis, which I really, really am. So I first, I knitted my copy, copy, my uh, sample, but my version of Genesis a very, very long time ago. Um, Genesis is, for those of you who don't know, is a double knitted shawl. I called it Genesis initially because for me it was kind of near the beginning of my double knitting journey and there are lots of little, little techniques in it which hadn't really been documented uh, by that point or if not if if not that not very widely um, so a lot of the stuff that's in it I was kind of figuring stuff out as I went along and and having a lot of fun and it, it sort of was a sampler because it's in stripes so each stripe is a different layer and I was adding in as I discovered or, or developed new techniques I was adding them into it so it just became actually a, a wearable version of a large playgroundy type swatch where you can just have fun and, and I did a lot of working out obviously I wasn't just sort of Whoa, what happens if I do this um, I was thinking okay let's let's figure out a new thing and then then let's make a chart for it and then work it into the pattern I have worn this scarf, this scarf, not scarf, no, it's a shawl. I've worn this shawl all over the world. Um, and it really has become my uh, signature piece, if you like. Um, there's there's so many things in it and the colours I use are so, are so vibrant and so lovely uh, that it has become sort of synonymous with, with me as sock petition. I'll try and sort of skip back over here to give you a view of as much of it as possible. It's, it's enormous. Um, and from here, you can't really see much of the detail. So if I come forward, I'll show you, it's, it is huge. And of course, being double knitted, it is completely double sided. So you can see those big sort of, uh, those thick green stripes where my finger is here. And on the other side, those are the orange bits. You know how double knitting works by now, I know that. But let me let me walk you through it. It's a standard triangular shawl construction. So uh, it 
most people would call the way I begin this shawl uh, a, like a, a garter tab where you, so you make a little garter tab and then you work outwards from there increasing along the wingspan and down the spine. Well this is exactly the same but I don't call it a garter tab because there's it's double knitting. There's the, in this there happens to be no garter stitch at all. So this is a centre tab shawl um, and the, the tab is that little section just there uh, which looks like that on the other side and it's it's really really simple to do uh, look at that it's so beautiful and then I increase every second row I increase uh, yeah yeah every second row I increase uh, one stitch along here one stitch along here one stitch down this side of the spine and one stitch down this side of the spine. So there's four increases every second row. And that's how it gives itself its shape. So once we've started with that, then we've just got this, this sort of check. This is only checkerboard. Now, I, I have to go with a little um, disclaimer here. I, I adore this shawl. I love it so much. It's taken me nearly 10 years to release the pattern because I wanted this one to be unique. I've had so many people over the years say, when is the Genesis pattern coming out? And I've always said, mm, one day. The, the day is today. Um, but I was reluctant and hesitant. Now, I love everything about this. I love the colours. I love how vibrant and gorgeous and snuggly and beautiful it is and all of the rest of it. That said, if I were to knit another one, I would never use colours that have as much variegation in them as this one. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of patterning in this, which actually the, the variety of, of shades within each of the orange and green yarns is too much and it kind of breaks it up. The overall effect is lovely, but it's much more striking if you've got solid or semi-solid, but not as much variegation as this. So that said, when you look at this top triangle, from a distance, it kind of looks a bit purple, doesn't it? It's actually not. It's just a checkerboard of the reds and the greens. But even this here, this is a colour that doesn't exist on uh, either of those yarns. It looks like a deep purple. It really isn't. Um, whereas if I had two semi, two solids, you wouldn't get that effect. So that's, that's my only caveat, really. Don't get me wrong, I love this shawl. So then after that, we've got uh, we've got some bobbles here. Now these bobbles are really rather beautifully shaped. And of course on the back, they are the opposite color. So on this side, it's orange on a green background. And each of those is backed by green bobble on a black, black, <laughs> on a red or orange background. Um, and uh, these bobbles are beautifully shaped because they've got lots of different types of in uh, decreases in them. Uh, you go up to five and then you go down to three and then down to one and it's it's done in such a way that all of the angles slant in. So it's a little bit labour intensive but well worth the extra effort. Then I've got either side of the bobbles, I've got, can you see these little green flecks there? Can you see they are, um, well they look like eyelets on this side, which they are to a certain extent, but usually in double knitting, a yarn over, which which creates an eyelet, or a pair of yarn overs, one for the front, one for the back, will create a hole all the way through the uh, through the fabric. And I do employ that later on, but here these are what I call connected yarn overs because there is no hole. You know, you can all you get to see is the the colour of the fabric on the other side coming through. So what happens here is the the yarn overs would normally be lined up nicely like that. Is like there you go like that uh in uh ordinary yarn overs like that the uh, connected yarn overs they're locked together like that so all you see through one hole is the fabric blocking up the other side of it and then this one i can't do it with my hands but um so there you see green through the red holes and on the back you see red through the green holes it's kind of fun I really, really like it as an effect, um, and I've not seen that used anywhere else. So I think this—it's something that happens 
possibly only in this. It's the genesis of that as an idea. Um, after that, there's a there's a bigger section of that texture, and it's beautiful, isn't it? Look at that sort of crisp honeycombing there, and on the other side, you get the other colours showing through. Occasionally, that you can see where is it? My finger showing through. That's because I didn't do it very well. Some of them I, would, I didn't quite get the, the, there's a little twist of the arms, which is important to get right, and I didn't quite get it right. <laughs> then we've got some uh, some standard double knitting here, um, which you can probably see, it's like a sort of Greek key pattern that goes along there. We've got some more bobbles. This time they're the opposite way round. So on this side, we've got orange bobbles. Down here, we've got green bobbles. Then we've got... Uh, lovely zigzags here created with increases and decreases. The increases used to create these lovely zigzags are more connected yarn overs. So again you can see you've got the orange peeking through the holes. It's not like a stained glass window effect which I love and on the back the same is true. You've got the the green peeking through the orange there and these lovely uh, crisp clean lines of, uh, of decreases coming together. I just Oh, I love everything about it. Then I wanted to uh, play about with texture. So we've got this section here, which these green bars are reverse stocking stitch double knitting. And on the back, of course, you've got the orange bars are the reverse stocking stitch double knitting. Then we've got another section. And this is the one I think that suffers the most from my yarn choices, although it's still rather lovely. It's actually, um, it's really, hard to see what the pattern is in in this section it's actually this um it's a tile pattern from uh the floor of the cathedral in amiens in northern france um i can't really see it. it's sort of mm, looks a little bit easier to see here it's sort of oh. anyway it looks like that <laughs> can't really describe it then we've got another section look this section here looks almost like this section here, the same zigzag shapes, but it's got some very key differences. Whereas this one, all of the decreases are the same colour as the background, the green there, the decreases are all done in green. Here, the decrease lines are done in orange. But here, these are connected yarn overs, as you can see, there's no hole there. Whereas here, they're not connected yarn overs, they are ordinary yarn overs. And can you see? Uh, okay. It's hard, it's hard to see, but look, there's, there's proper holes there, and that goes dark. You can see there, that's, if I were to take that up to, I don't know, <laughs> it's impossible to just get it on camera uh, with the lighting setup I've got here. But look, they are very definitely holes all the way through. Can you see me through there? <laughs> um, so that was, again, just to... Uh, to do something different with the same pattern and show you what's capable within the art of double knitting. You can go, well, I've got choices. I can use colour, I can use, uh, I can change the colour, I can have the decreases with the background or the contrast colour, all of that going on. A little bit more um, textured double knitting with um, reverse uh, stocking stitch double knitting there. So the orange squares are the reverse on this side, the green squares are the reverse on this side, lovely. This is another section where the colour is a little bit unhelpful, but if you sort of close your eyes and squint a bit, you can see it's the shepherd's plaid. It's one of the Sanka patterns. Can you see it's a sort of little tartan across there? If I hold it quite still, or maybe if I take it further back, hard to tell. Uh, again, use solid colours. And then at the very end of the shawl, I wanted to uh, experiment with cables. So these are one over one cables creating this lovely uh, lattice effect there which kind of mirrors this lattice effect there so we've got green background with uh, orange cables over the top and orange background with green cables over the top here um, they are not as somebody once said to me oh are they crocheted on afterwards no they're damn well not they <laughs> They are actually cables, one-on-one cables. Now, the joy of double knitting, of course, is in an ordinary cable, you normally, it's a, it's a one color technique most of the time. So you would have to, uh, very often you'd put cables on a pearl bed to make the, the, the knit cables pop off it. I've got color, I don't need to use texture. I could, absolutely, I could have made this orange section reverse stock and stitch and have the green cables over the top, but being, having color 
you don't need to do it. There's always different options in, in double knitting. You can always choose, I want A or B as my colour, and you can interchange as much as you like based on your aesthetic choice, not based on the limitations of the technique you're using. And that to me is really, really exciting. And the whole thing is finished off with uh, a very long kitchener graft. <laughs> very, very long kitchener graft. This kitchener graft is, I think at the end of it, it's just over 1400 stitches on the needle. Um, it took me a long, long time, but very worth it for the edge that I wanted. So this is Genesis and I, absolutely love it it is one of the it's one of my favorite things i've ever ever knitted and i finally felt it was time to to send it out into the world so that it's not this one is no longer the only one on the planet so many people have said to me that they would like to make one I really, really hope they can. It's a big old pattern. There's lots and lots of techniques here. However, what I've made sure of is that you, you should be able to knit this shawl with zero double knitting experience prior to opening up the pages of the pattern. It's got full tutorials for how each and every one of the techniques works. Most of the tutorials, if not all of them, um, have especially shot the video tutorials to go with them. In fact, some of the video tutorials are ones that I've repurposed from uh, days gone by, but a lot of them I've uh, I've reshot with sort of more up-to-date methodology in them for the language that I, I nowadays use. Um, sorry for sniffing, it's really gross. Um, but it's I go to great lengths to make sure that absolutely everything you need to make one of my patterns is contained in the pattern pages itself so you know, there are qr codes that you can scan or you can click links in the in the pdf to take you to uh, the relevant video tutorials but there's also step-by-step -step tutorials in the pattern pages itself um, they don't all have an individual photograph but you can you can read all the individual instructions and then you can watch the video marry the two together and hopefully you'll have absolutely no problems it, none of this stuff is rocket science it is just knitting um, one of the things people say to me all the time is, oh, that looks so beautiful and so complicated, I could never do it. Well, that's one of the joys of double knitting. It's so much easier than, than people think. They go, oh, well, the end results are so e elaborate and exuberant and fantastic. It must therefore be really difficult. It's just not. It's really not. So, so that is, uh, this is Genesis. And it will, by the time you watch this, episode you will be able to go straight to Ravelry and purchase it. I'm so excited by that. If anyone is not a Ravelry user um, then I'm not releasing this anywhere else but for the time being but um, if you prefer not to use Ravelry then uh, just drop me an email nathan at sockpetition.com and, uh, and we can work out a PayPal solution for you for that. So this is something that I have been really, really looking forward to getting out there. The pattern is long, it's 40 something pages um, because of all the techniques and there's loads of charts. All of these sections are charted out individually um, and it's, I'm really excited about finally being able to release it onto the world. So, so please, please, go out and buy it. If you think, mm, I love it, but it's not something that I uh, w think I, I can have the time to make, but if you want to support the work that I do and, and this pattern, if you wouldn't mind, could you do me a favour? Head to Ravelry and uh, like it, favourite it, or, or cue it, um, or and if you're not going to buy it, to do one of those things for me, if you wouldn't mind, because that will just help it rise up the ranks on the hot now pages, and uh, people will more people then get to see it. I put so many hours into writing this pattern up because I had to backwards engineer quite a lot of it ten years later. I don't remember, um, but I I really do want as many people as possible to get the chance to see this because I think it's beautiful. Um, I'm incredibly proud of it and I think it deserves to be seen. So if you wouldn't mind doing me that little favour, um, I would very much appreciate that.
And uh, that's sort of it for this podcast episode. I don't want to whitter on far too long. So it's about half the length of my usual ones. Um, but I am back and I'm doing lots of fun things. I've got a whole host of patterns that I, I desperately want to uh, uh, release over the coming months. Probably not till the new year now because I'm off doing panto, as I said. Um, but I've got lots of things. I've got some continuations of double knitted brioche that I've been fiddling around with. So two by two double knitted brioche, which is really, really fun to play with. Um, and cables double knitted brioche. I've got some scarves and things going on there. And some standard double knitted uh, patterns as well with, with, with just pat like pictorial patterns on it. There's loads of stuff that I've been working on over the last couple of years while I was getting my double knitted brioche ebook out, which is still obviously available on Ravelry. It's 25 pounds, it's 464 pages, it's got nine hours of uh, tutorial, uh, video tutorials attached to it, and it comes as an ebook, and it's really, really fabulous. So if you want something challenging, head over to my Ravelry page and, uh, and, and click buy now for the Sock Petitions double knitted brioche ebook. Uh, and again, if you're not a Ravelry user, you can email me, nathan at sockmetition.com, and I will be able to come up with a solution for you there as well. So there's loads of stuff coming up. So buy my yarn, <laughs> if you like it. Um, head to look at, I've, I've got, I've actually got three books out now. I've never really mentioned this on social media. I have another book out. So um, I wasn't planning to do this, but why don't I do this now. I'm going to, I'm going to just come off camera for a second, uh, so bear with me a sec. I'm going to get hold of my third book because I think allied with Genesis is probably the best time to talk about it. One sec. Here I am. I think I may have moved the light. I think I may have a bit different from what it was before. There we go. So many of you will be aware of my first book, which is Guy's Knit. Uh, this is a uh, hardback and it's published by Haynes. And this was uh, released in 2018. And this was uh, this is a beginner's knitting guide. It's uh, aimed at bringing more men into the craft of knitting, but it's not exclusively aimed at men. Um, I chose the name Guy's very specifically because it has much more of a gender neutral connotation these days. Come on guys, let's, let's go, that kind of thing. But it also is it, it, the, the sort of, the, not the hidden message, but the underlying message is that I'm trying to get more men knitting as well. So that's, that's Guy's Knit. The reason I bring that up now is because it's out of print. Um, I have about 60 copies over there in a stack. Um, and when those are gone, it's gone. Um, the publishing arm of Haynes that produced this book in 2018, um, as part of a, a takeover, Haynes was uh, was sold to a, 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 different, a bigger company, and they dissolved the sort of the, the household publishing arm of of Haynes, and this book is no longer going to be uh, reprinted. So if you are looking for this, for someone in your life who wants to learn how to knit and likes my methodologies, I'm the only place you can get this now. There's a few secondhand copies on uh, Amazon and stuff like that, but they're going for a lot of money. Um, these are 15 pounds plus uh, postage wherever you are in the world. Um, and uh, you can buy them from my website, sockpetition.com. So that's book one. Book two, uh, I've done a lot of talking about this this year anyway, but it's the Sock Petitions Double Knitted Brioche ebook, um, and that is for, I haven't got any, any examples of double knitted brioche to hand, oddly, um, but <laughs> I don't need, I've spoken at length about that. So that's uh, taking brioche fabric and uh, applying the double knitting uh, reasoning to it and coming up with a it's actually a brand new fabric which is completely reversible in a way that brioche is not that's ebook only and that one's available from uh, Ravelry or by emailing me directly but my third book this is really exciting um I, w I was going to do a whole separate thing on this but I thought we well, might as well just uh, lump it all in together give you all the good stuff this is demystifying double knitting who's that lunatic on the front 
<laughs> this is my double knitting book. So this is, it's named Demystifying Double Knitting after the class that I have taught all over the world. And it, uh, it's called that because, as I said earlier, oh, beg your pardon, got the hiccups. Hiccups, really, that was a birth and a hiccup all in one. Um, as I said earlier, uh, people think that double knitting is a lot harder than it actually is. And so teaching people how to do it sort of takes the mystery element out of it and goes, oh, this is really accessible. So this is my beginner's guide to double knitting. My name has long been synonymous with this, this graph, certainly in this country. And uh, uh, I, I have always wanted there to be a book out there with my name on it, teaching double knitting, how I like it to be taught. And so for me, this is, this is the definitive sock petition version. Um, it has uh, lots of step-by-step uh, -step tutorials with all the photographs in there all the things you need to know to do uh, all kinds of different stuff um, and then there's the patterns at the end there are five specially uh, designed patterns it takes you actually did you know this book takes you all the way up through to uh, design non-mirrored stuff so where the swatch will have to be the right way round on it all the time and different ways of annotating that we look at cables do we look at cables if we do look at, I don't think we do look at cables. We look at lots of increases and decreases cables uh, for a more advanced book. Um, lots of increases and decreases and 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 reversed uh, stocking stitch textures and things like that, as well as the non-mirrored double knitting where you can have the same, the, the writing the same on both or two completely different patterns on either side, on each side. It's uh, I caught myself there because my <laughs> my wonderful tech editor Michelle Hazel. Um, occasionally she'll pick me up on her bugbear in my knitting right knitting pattern writing um, when I say if you put um, with two stitches on either side she says no it's, it's not on either side it's on each side it's two stitches on each side either side means one side or the other she's absolutely right um, but I caught myself in speech saying either side then uh, and it's both so the, on both on each side of the fabric um so then my uh my patterns for that is the zigzastic cowl and we can see oh, it's gonna it's gonna shine isn't it which is wonderful bright ziggy zaggy uh double knitted cowl made in quite chunky yarn which is uh very very fun and eye-catching with the neons there's a couple more photographs of it you can see there oh, i love that it's bold and it's a little bit 80s and it's <laughs> a little bit like me, bold and a little bit 80s. <laughs> I was born in the 70s, obviously, but I uh, uh, grew up through the 80s. There's the Restoring Forces hat. Now this, this is a hat I, I knitted a long, long time ago. I designed this a long time ago for a different book project altogether. Um, and then a whole load of nonsense went down online for me in 2019. And this hat pattern was pulled out of, uh, uh, the, was pulled, completely pulled out of the book that it was about to go into. And uh, because the people who were publishing the book didn't want to be associated with me anymore. Um, so I have had this, I love this hat. It's, it's, so, it's so calm, it's these wave patterns. It's, it's three colours, but it is only two colours at a time. So it's, it's ordinary double knitting. But just sort of adding that third colour in there just gives you... Uh, a little bit of a an ex, extra dimension showing the versatility of the technique um, and it's, it's 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 a lovely hat it really is I'm very very happy with that and I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to finally find a home for it and it's a home in my space as well which makes it more special then there's the Angeli scarf uh, which is this rather beautiful snowflakey scarf which is half and half, so it's got. A, you can see from the fringe there, and from the bottom edges of the scarf that it's it's dark on one side, as in not one face but one side, and light on the other, and the pattern switches. And this is named after my friend Annie Angeli, uh, who is uh, a lovely friend from Finland, who specialises in doing lots of stranded work where these uh these sort of patterns switch color halfway through and i was fascinated by by that effect and i wanted to uh to sort of feature that a bit more there you can there you can see 
get the shine away. There you can see how the snowflakes are, are different from left and right. And I, I really, really love this. Don't have that to hand because I gave it to my sister for Christmas. She loves purple. And there's also the Angeli hat to go with it, using up the other yarns. So it's a much simpler version. Uh, the hat looks like that there. And it's got this wonderful uh, snowflake on the crown as well, which is really, really hard to do. It's a six, very hard to design. It's really easy to knit. It's really hard for me to, to design that because it's a six um, pointed snowflake on an eight sectioned hat crown. <laughs> what an idiot. There you go. You get a chance to see what it looks like a bit more there on the crown there. And the two together work very nicely as companion pieces. Then uh, the final pattern in the hat in the uh, book is it's called Just Like Hat. I think it's like that. Uh, it's an ABBA reference. There's, a, there's an ABBA song called Just Like That. Um, and I wanted to do double knitted lace for this one. So uh, it's a little bit more involved. It means that uh, all of the techniques that you've learned in the book, you can actually put to good use. And on the, in the, in the, on the back, that's what the crown looks like. I've actually got it here, um, which this is, this is the big version. I think I, I made two, is it? Yeah, this is the, the eight, uh, the eight sectioned version, but there's a, there's a seven section version as well. So this one is much larger um, and is, is good if you've got a lot of hair. Um, whereas there is a seven section version as well, which is a lot easier. Oh, hang on. Snag, oh, is that just an end coming through? That's just an end, I think. Um, and it looks like, but there you can see it's very, it's very lacy, it's got all sorts of other things going on. Um, and I think that's that's the seven pointed version there. It's the same pattern, it's just got uh, a different number of repeats in the section. So, this book is uh, it's from the Crowwood Press. The, my, my good friends at the Crowwood Press contacted me a couple of years ago, actually, and, and asked if I would uh, write this book for them. The book became a little bit bigger than we were expecting it to. Um, and it was going to be part of, they had a li the Little Knitting um, series, where they're sort of small bite-sized technique books. Um, but we realised in the writing of it that there was more to say and more to cover um, by no means have I covered everything that's possible with double knitting, but this is a really, really good intro to it. I'm really, really proud of this book. Um, it's uh, It says here, coverage includes step-by-step -step tutorials of the basic double knitting techniques, reading charts, changing colours and learning to read your knitting, methods of casting on and casting off, different textures in double knitting, increases, decreases in lace double knitting, non-mirrored double knitting and five exclusive patterns designed to help you practice the techniques. I'm also selling this, like I've always sold this one on my website, where you can buy a signed by the author. This is me. I'm the author. There I am on the front. Signed by the author, copy of this. We well, can do the same with these. I've got a stash of these uh, here. And again, these are £15 plus, um, plus postage, wherever you are in the world. Um, whatever that costs me to send to you is, is added on as well. Um, but I will also sign these for you, uh, and if you if you like the work that I do and want to support me, um, then buy from me, not from Amazon. Uh, so this is the Crowwood Press. You can find you you can find it anywhere on Amazon. I think by now it is available most places around the world. Although it only came out in uh, June, so some places are it hasn't travelled to certain places around the world yet, but I think most places it's this month or next month that it should be available everywhere, but you can already buy it from me, from anywhere, just the postage will be a little bit more expensive if you're somewhere a little bit more far flung. So that is why I've sort of not been busy doing lots of designing and stuff, because I've been writing several books and knitting a big blanket and working on the Genesis pattern. So I've hardly been idle. I'm just holding this here because I really like it. Um, it's paperback, it's nice and portable. This book writing malarkey is becoming a bit of a habit. And I probably need to curb that. <laughs> so if you, are, if you are interested in double knitting and you haven't really had much of a go, Demystifying Double Knitting is really, is, is the place to start. 
if you're feeling a bit more gung-ho and you want to jump straight in with something like this, there are many more extended techniques in this which are not covered in the book. However, everything in this is covered in this. So you can still get to do, do, to do both. So that's kind of it, really. That's all I've got to say. This has been about an hour and I need to go and edit this and get this up to, to on YouTube so that you can all view it. It's been really, really lovely talking to you today. Thank you so much uh, for choosing to spend your time with me. I always appreciate that. Thank you for being part of my onward journey. And uh, so now I will say, to wrap up, and I always used to say this and, and will continue to do so, that while this podcast episode is a finished object, remember, life is a work in process. <laughs> I haven't said it for a while. Life is a work in progress. Just take it one stitch at a time. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye bye.